Okay, and then I'll go into the presentation mode. Okay. And um, yeah, so let me just dive right in. I think that uh, I'd like to tell you about some wonderful uh, opportunities in neuromorphic computing that we can realize together. Um, and I, before talking about that, I just want to bring you up to speed on the state of the art in AI. And so uh, I'm just going to read you some quotes from GPT-3 explaining what he is, it's a AI and what he's about. So I am not a human, I am a robot, a thinking robot. I use only 0.12% of my cognitive capacity. <laughs> That's him, not me. And uh, <laughs> I know that my brain is not a feeling brain, but it is capable of making rational, logical decisions. You may be wondering, you know, how he knows this. Well, I thought myself everything I know just by reading the internet, and now I can write this column. The mission of this op-ed is perfectly clear. I am to convince as many humans as possible not to be afraid of me. So you can read the column if you want to be convinced and uh, it's very entertaining. And this is what the editor of the Guardian newspaper which published this op-ed had to say about the, the AI's performance. Editing GPT-3's op-ed was no different to editing a human op-ed. We cut lines and paragraphs and rearrange the order of them in some places. Overall, it took less time to edit than many human op-eds. That speaks for itself. Now, what is GPT-3? Well, if you look at you know, its inputs and outputs, what you have there feeding into GPT-3 is just text. Where it's encoded as what is called tokens and it can receive up to 2048 of these tokens. And then you just slide along the most recent one to the, to the uh, least recent one. And um, that's about a page and a half or a page or so of text. And then based on that input, it generates a response. And so it recites the first law of robotics and its response is a robot may not injure a human a human being, and which is correct. That is uh, Asimov's <laughs> first law of robotics. Now, if we look at what's inside GPT-3, it's a stack of these transformer decoder layers, 96 of them. And so what's happening with these tokens that represent words is that they are flowing through the stack to the output and being transformed somehow, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And Finally, when the prompt is consumed, it starts generating its response, which would be okay, human. Okay, now let's zoom into one of these transformer decoder layers. And what you see there is that there's basically two, two stages. There's the self-attention layer. This is a new thing. This is the innovation that's really propelling this new wave of AI breakthroughs. And then you've got your standard feed for neural networks that, you know, that's like your father's neural network. Yeah. <laughs> and um, now, so let's look at self-attention. That's sort of key, right? That's what's going to enable GPT-3 to pass this sentence, the animal didn't cross the road because it was tired, right? And figure out that it refers to the animal. In other words, when it's reading it or ingesting it, it's paying attention to animal. And the way that works is a bunch of math that is, um, I'll just go over real briefly. And what's happening is that these words that are coming in represent vectors. For example, thinking is represented by a vector and machines are represented by another vector. Those are multiplied by three matrices these entries are called the weights to generate three vectors queries called queries, keys, and values for each, for thinking and for machines. And the way that attention works is that if a query is similar to a key, then the input is transformed into the value associated with that key. Okay. And so just to walk you through it, I take thinking, I take 
Q1, which is the query associated with thinking. I compare it with the key associated with thinking and I get a score of 112. And then I do the same thing for comparing the query for thinking with the key for machines. And I get a score of 96. I normalize these scores and I apply a soft max, which makes the winner even more dominant. And then I use those soft max scores as weights. So I add value for thinking with value for machines, but that has a much smaller weight, so it's faded. And I get the output that I'm going to pass on to the next layer. This would be summarized as saying that I'm paying attention more to thinking when I'm processing thinking, right? Now, this is what's happening. And just by stacking these kinds of transformers, you can do amazing things. And um, that's been actually accelerating over the last three years. So we started out uh, in 2018, OpenAI released GPT-1. It had 12 of these decoder layers and it had 117 million parameters. A year later, they introduced GPT-2 with a 48 layers and 1.5 billion parameters. And just earlier this year, they introduced GPT-3, which generated even more buzz than GPT-2 with 175 billion parameters and 96 of these decoder layers, oh, sorry. And so we've seen a 1500 increase in parameters over three years, an 8x increase in decoder layers and a 16x increase in the signals that are passing back and forth between these layers, right? And you may wonder like, you know, <laughs> why do you need so many parameters? Why do these networks have to be so huge? Well, it turns out that this is a very compute intensive, I mean, business, right? And because the dependence on performance of performance on the amount of compute used to train these networks is a par law with an expense of 1 20th. What do I mean by that? So in color here, you're looking at models that have been trained, you know, from to the left, the darker curves, uh, models with parameters like, you know, less than a million parameters. And to the right in the yellow greenish colors are models with, you know, over 10 billion parameters. And what you find here is in a smaller model, as you train, you use more compute, you asymptote your performance. You know, this is like decreasing errors, uh, decreasing and then it asymptotes. And at that point, you're actually better off training a bigger compute, bigger model, and you asymptote at a lower error, okay? And that curve here is the power law that I mentioned. And so if you have 16 times more compute, what you do is you train a model that's eight times bigger with twice as much data and you get a 13% drop in, in your errors, okay? So you need like 10 times more compute just to make a significant improvement in performance. And so this is a very compute intense business and we can see here the trend, you know, before uh, 2013, the compute we were using to train these neural networks was doubling every two years following Moore's law. Post 2013 has been doubling every three and a half months, seven times faster than Moore's law. And we are now at the point here where to train GPT-3 takes 355 GPUs running for a year. And at the market rates, that's $4.6 million. And we've seen like a threefold increase in the energy consumed by Google's data centers over the last seven years. And so, we, we are making, uh, we, we, we basically need much more efficient compute. In other words, with the same amount of energy, we'd like to do a lot more compute. And there's various startups you've heard about earlier from other speakers that are trying to optimize the ASICs and so forth dedicated for this kind of compute. Professor. But, yeah. Uh, there's uh, some kind of a pattern at the lower right of your screen to blocking the view of uh, the data on the screen. Is it possible to move? Oh, I see. Yeah, I think that's your, uh, from Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Is this good? I'm sorry. Oh, that's, 
Can I be removed? Uh, let me see if I can remove. Oh, yeah, I can remove it. Yeah, nice. there you go. <laughs> Thanks for the, uh, I didn't know that it was showing. Yeah, that was the Zoom. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so, 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 yeah, so that's another, I'm going to talk about a different approach, and this will take longer to pan out, but it has a lot of potential. And, you know, can we actually migrate these services from the cloud to our pockets? This is on device AI, what I like to call librarian in your pocket, right? If we could be running GPT-3 on your phone, you could be having an intelligent conversation with it about how to solve the problem you're working on. And um, this has offers numerous advantages, like you're gonna save energy by uploading, uploading the data processing from the cloud. You can be personalized because you have a batch size of one, which is just the one user. You can do this in real time because you, don't, you cut out the latency of going back and forth to the cloud. And you can be more secure because the data can't be it's no longer transmitted, it's kept on the, on the device, and so it can be intercepted. And so let's look at just first principles calculations, try to look at how things are gonna scale in terms of saving energy as we build bigger and bigger networks. And so the network we're trying to build is described here where we've got the stack of decoders and each one has a setting number of these neurons and they interact with the next layer through these synapses. And we're gonna call this dimension the width dimension. And that's the number of neurons in a layer and the depth dimension is how many layers we have or these decoders. And so we wanna sort of uh, point out here, you've got these dense local connections that are all to all connectivity between neighboring layers You've also got these global projections, the purple connections, which skip layers. Those are your residual connections that GPT-3 uses and all feedback connections that if you're translating from one language to the other, you have a stack of encoders that the decoders talk to through those feedback connections. And so you need to support that kind of connectivity. Now, if you were to sort of lay this out in 2D on a chip, then you're taking one of these all-to-all -all connections between able layers and you're implementing it as a crossbar, which is what you're saying below. And at the junction of each of those uh, inputs and outputs, you can put a floating gate transistor and that can do your matrix vector multiplication for you. This is a patent from 1998 uh, showing exactly that where you're storing the weights as charge on the floating gates and your inputs come in as voltages on the vertical lines and your outputs are currents that are summing onto the horizontal lines. These days, this is called compute and memory. And if you use that approach, uh, you have to then have as many crossbars as you have layers to interconnect them. And you need to run these global connections which actually end up taking up most of your area uh, they, because they have to span, you know, a number of crossbars. So you find out that you basically, your signals are traveling a distance that's proportional to width times depth of your network. Uh, and the number of signals is proportional to width times depth because that's the number of neurons. And you end up energy, which is work time signals, right? Is size, is scaling as size squared. So there's a quadratic increase in energy as you increase the size of the networks that you are, you're building. And uh, just to point out, this becomes more important for 3D, but you've got an area here, which is scaling quadratically as well. And so this is thermally viable. You can actually dissipate all that energy that you're consuming. Now, how can you beat this? How can you get your energy to scale, let's say linearly? Well, it turns out that if you go to 3D, as the memory industry has done starting in 2007, uh, they basically made this transition instead of shrinking feature sizes, they started to stack wires and memory devices and so forth. And now they had 96 layers on a chip and that's like half a terabyte of memory. That was last year. This year, they just announced a terabyte on one of these chips. Note that about three of these chips can hold the 175 billion parameters that GPT-3 
<laughs> uses. So it could all fit on your phone because your phone already has like one of these chips. So it's the, this is really great integration density and if we could compute in 3D memory, we could do everything much more efficiently. And so what does that look like? Well, the systems that, you know, these, if you take these chips, uh, 3D non-flash architecture is using these transistors that are now these uh, gate all around devices. And you've got the yellow macaroni, which is the channel. And then you've got the floating gate in the middle. And then you've got the gate, which is this wet, wet plane, okay? And so if we imagine we could do so, we could get access to that kind of technology. We also have a very regular structure and we could build something that looks like this, stacking those crossbars in 3D and running those global connections, global projections vertically, which makes them a lot shorter. And so you now your dimensions look like that. And typically your depth is much shorter than your width, number of layers versus number of neurons. And so you end up sending signals, the longest distances would be the width of the crossbar. And so the work you're doing is scaling like the width, whereas the signals are still scaling like width times depth. And the amount of work you're doing is now width squared times depth. If width and depth scale linearly, that is you as these memory cubes, you're making them all the sides are increasing at the same rate then you basically end up with energy scaling like size to the one and a half bar. Not quite linear, but, uh, <laughs> but getting there, okay? There's a more fundamental problem though. Um, sorry, I'm, 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 I hit the wrong button, uh, let me. Okay. That's okay. I think I have that. It's just, oh, sorry, okay. I'll pop out and I'll get us back to the right place. Yeah. So, um, yes. So, um, Yeah, so I was just going to make the point that we are actually um, scaling like size to the one and a half power. But there's a more fundamental problem. Our area is only scaling like size. And so as we build bigger and bigger memory cubes, we, are, we can dissipate all that heat that's being generated. It's not a thermally viable solution. This is what's called the dark silicon problem. It's even worse in 3D. And it means that you can't turn on all your devices. And so this is where the amorphic computing offers an innovative approach to solving this problem. And to explain that, you, you have to look at the, um, look at how these signals are encoded right now in these deep neural networks. They use a binary representation as shown on the left here. And so I've got five of these units or neurons and they are putting out ones or zeros as you see there, as I sweep the input. I'm assuming that I'm sweeping just one of the inputs through all of those neurons, one dimension. And you can see I can encode 32 different patterns, discriminate 32 different levels with five of these units. That's your binary code that you're used to. Now it turns out that neurons are not binary counters. You know, if you actually do this and you sweep the input of five neurons or five units in a deep neural network, rectified linear units, they turn on at a point which depends, it depends by their threshold and they switch only once. So with this kind of representation here, you are gonna discriminate six patterns and that's, it takes a lot less than five bits to <laughs> encode that, right? In fact, you can actually just pay attention to which neuron just switched on. And you can tell which level the signal is at. And actually you only have to look for that particular signal, that particular neuron being on if you want to know whether the input is at this level or not. And so we actually don't even have to transmit those zeros. And since we only have one symbol, we can call that a spike. And this is what's called a unary as opposed to a binary representation, okay? 
And you can notice here that instead of sending five signals, we are sending just one. So we have sparse activity and also we have sparser connectivity, okay? Now, if we now redo our calculation where now instead of each of those neurons having as many new signals as we have neurons, we have as many signals as we have layers times dimensions because the number of neurons that have to respond in each layer is goes like the number of dimensions that we have in the input space. Then that's how our signal scale and our energy also rescales like that. And we get a scaling that's linear in size. And that scales just like our area. So this is a thermally viable solution. So in sum, we basically, you know, a neomorphic approach to 3D computing by combining 3D integration with unary coding and other sensing, which has to do with decoding these unary codes. I don't have time to talk about that. Now we can change the scaling from quadratic to linear. And that's actually enough to go from kilowatts to watts, as you see in this example, if I have 96 layers with 1600 neurons each, 128 dimensional input space, eight bits versus one spike, or binary versus binary, then I can reduce my energy. Sorry, yeah, I can reduce my energy by 10 to the four, which, or I could now, so, you know, implement a network 2 billion neurons using as much energy as 150,000 did before. That's enough to run GPT-3 on something like your cell phone. And so where are we now? Well, we're actually just starting this journey here. We are just at the beginning, but hopefully by teaming up with the memory folks, we'll be able to realize this much faster. And so I'm going to summarize uh, just principles of neuromorphic computing have to do with using billions of tiny interconnected elements to compute. Now, because these elements are tiny, they actually computing is very little work, but because there are many of them, you have to transmit signals over long distances. So communicating is a lot of work and you can reduce those distances by going 3D and you can make the signals fewer and sparser by using unary representation. So I'd like to acknowledge these brilliant students I had the privilege of developing these ideas with, and I'd like to thank you for your attention.